Welcome, friends. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really very excited to introduce Helen Thorpe, whom obviously many of you already know, um, who is a member of Mountain View Friends Meeting, of Intermountain Yearly Meeting, um, and whom I met at Intermountain Yearly Meeting two years ago. And we had a wonderful conversation um, about lots of things, about ministry and about other things. And she sent me a copy of her hardback edition of the book, which I really, really enjoyed. I think it's a really important book, um, which is the story of two uh, undocumented um, <coughs> high school immigrants and two doc documented ones and their different experiences. And um, she tells the story really beautifully. And when we talked about the possibility of her coming to the gathering last year, and it didn't work out, but she agreed to come this year, um, just as her book has come out in paperback. So it's been really now it's more reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, yes, and um, so I'm really excited to um, have her speak with you. And um, as we customarily do, we usually start a little bit in worship, and then Helen will speak out of the worship, and then there'll be um, substantive time for dialogue. And I think she might be willing to sign a book or two if you um, if you buy it, <laughs> <laughs> or if you have one that you've bought already. So, um, welcome, Helen. Thank you. Some of my um, earliest memories as a child are, um, I remember uh, visiting the farm, the dairy farm that my grandmother and grandfather, my grandfather passed away when I was young. so. For much of the time, it was my grandmother, ran and um, pulling on Wellington boots and running out in the field with my cousins and going to get the cows. And um, this was in Cavan, County Cavan, Ireland. And that's when we visited my mom's side of the family. And then I also remember very vividly, um, like, I think maybe at the age of like eight or nine, being set loose in Dublin by my parents when we were visiting my dad's side of the family and being handed a couple of really big Irish coins are really, especially in those days before they switched over the euro, really big heavy coins and being given enough bus fare to get into the center of Dublin and being told what bus would take us from my aunt's house on the wrong side of Dublin into the city center and then being told to come on back. And um, that's Irish parenting style. <laughs> um, so my parents both grew up in Ireland and I, I mention that because I think on immigration everybody comes from somewhere on this subject. Everybody has a story about whether they do or don't think of themselves as an immigrant or how recently their immigration story began or um, so um, so I, I, I kind of mentioned that just to just to start there um, I was living in Denver Colorado I was interested in what was happening in my community and I was particularly interested in what change was happening in, in my community when um, I began this book project. And I was really inspired by a certain kind of writing. Um, some of the authors that I really admire that I was inspired by are um, William Finnegan, Bill Finnegan. Um, he, uh, wrote a, he wrote a book called Cold New World, and it's all dealing with um, young people in what some people might call the underclass or uh, kids growing up poor in America. Um, also, Adrienne LeBlanc, who spent 10 years following the lives of uh, young women in the South Bronx who were growing up on welfare and then having children and getting welfare and that cycle of poverty. Um, and in particular, as a book that really very much inspired me is a book by Anne Fadiman called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. And it's ama I see a couple people nodding. It's just an incredible book. I love it because it 
she tells so beautifully these two different sides of um, the intersection of a Hmong family with a daughter uh, who they believe is being visited by divine spirits and their intersection with Western doctors who are trying to care for this child now that they're in this country who diagnose their daughter with epilepsy and really want her to take certain medicines. And um, just that culture, uh, the, 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 the gulf in culture and the difficulty of communicating and all of that, just really with my background, coming from Ireland, it's a lot easier to integrate here and you look like the majority of white people in this country and you don't have some of the experiences that a Hmong family or a Mexican family has, but still, um, it was one of my favorite books of all time, I think partly because of my family story. And so I um, was going around my hometown wondering what life was like for other children who were being brought here by their parents, like I was. I was one when my parents arrived in this country, I grew up with a green card. Uh, and I was particularly interested in what life was like for those kids being brought here without documentation. So, um, kind of amazingly, I found four young women who were willing to spend an awful lot of time with me, um, who were best friends growing up together in Denver, Colorado, all from Mexican immigrant families, all from Spanish-speaking family backgrounds, all straight-A students, all in AP classes, grown up sleeping over at each other's houses, doing everything together, who happened to be split down the middle in terms of their legal status. And when I met them, it was their senior year of high school, and they were just discovering what this predicament that our laws and their parents' choices had created for them, which not a predicament of their own making, but they were about to start um, feeling the, the consequences mm -hmm. of it. Um, one of the things I wanted to do when I was writing was just sort of get away from the really tired arguments that we've been having over and over and over again, the rhetoric that you see in the newspapers. And I wanted to kind of remind people that immigration is actually one of the richest stories happening in our communities today. And for example, it's really funny. And when you read the editorials about immigration, you know, people sound angry and it's, it sounds really yucky and you want to put the paper down and it's really frustrating. But, I mean, if you're spending time in these families and you're looking at what's going on in their lives, like there are things that happen that are really, really funny. People don't think about immigration as funny, but I found aspects of it hilarious. For example, the young woman who kind of becomes the main, she emerges as the main character out of this group of four, because uh, she's the liveliest, Maricela Benavides. You know, we, the book opens three quarters of the way through her final year of high school. Maricela Benavides ran into a problem. Her father wanted to attend her senior prom. <laughs> so I won't go into that whole chapter, but basically her dad, who's a conservative Mexican father, really knows that the right thing for him to do is to chaperone her, his daughter at this event, and she is horrified. Social death in America to have your dad with you at your senior prom. So the whole sort of first chapter of the book is them wrangling over, is he going to come, and is she going to get to go with her date without her dad? And, this sort of thing. And um, I thought starting there would, would be great because American audiences, many of us will remember our senior prom and all the drama associated with what were we going to wear and who was going to come. And I bet not many of us had our parents saying they were coming along, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, and you see this young woman totally stuck in this cultural fix, where she's growing up in the United States, she speaks perfect English, she's getting straight A's, she's in AP classes, she is also working full time at a, rest, at a um, grocery store to help support her family, and her, her very culturally Mexican family is telling her there's one way to do things, and 
all of her peers at school and her teachers are telling her there's, a, there's another way to do things. So that's kind of this basic dilemma that you see that, that she's stuck in. Um, there's this other <coughs> predicament that she has where um, you know, two of her friends are able to do a whole bunch of things and, and she, she can't. So Maricela and her best friend Yadira spend all of their time with Elissa and Clara who do have legal status. And suddenly it's starting to, to become clear um, that Maricela and Yadira can't qualify for in-state tuition in the state of Colorado, can't obtain a Pell Grant or any federal subsidy to pay for college, don't qualify for most of the big private scholarships that are available, uh, can't drive legally, can't work legally, have difficulty trying to open a bank account, aren't allowed to fly on an airplane when other classmates go on a class trip to Washington, D.C. because they don't have the ID to board an airplane, can't take a bus across state lines without risking a check on the bus that could get them deported. They can't do even really simple things, like some of their friends start going to nightclubs, but you need an ID to get into a nightclub, so suddenly that's hard for them. And then Yadira goes to Blockbuster and tries to rent a movie, and they say, okay, where's your driver's license? So she can't rent the movie at Blockbusters either, whereas Clara and Elissa can do all these things. So they've grown up as equals. They're in this country where we talk about equality a lot, and something's wrong with this picture because they're four best friends. They know that they're equally capable on the inside, but somehow the world is saying they're not equal, even though we talk about things and say everybody's equal. So they're starting to get really confused. And the way that um, Maricela sort of articulated this, um, she said, when I was growing up, it, I didn't really think about it at first. It hit me when I wanted to get a driver's license, and I couldn't. So I started driving with a Mexican driver's license, a fake, which she bought on the black market. And that's when I realized how I was going to grow up doing everything the wrong way. So Clara and Elissa go, can go get legal driver's licenses. Yadira chooses not to drive at all. Maricela chooses to go get a fake driver's license. And when I was thinking about this subject, right at the very beginning, um, it leapt out at me that this was related to one of our testimonies. And what I wanted to talk about today were two Quaker testimonies in conjunction with the subject of immigration. I think I could talk about more. There, I could probably talk about three or four, but maybe we have time for two. And obviously, the one that leapt out at me right away was the, the testimony of equality, which I think everybody in the room is familiar. And you, don't, you could probably tell me more about the testimony of equality. I, I see elders from meetings I go to or have gone to who could tell me of equality than I, I could tell anybody. But I went this morning and got what Wikipedia says about our testimony on equality, <laughs> just to refresh everybody's memory. <laughs> testimony of equality is a shorthand description of the action generally taken by members of the Religious Society of Friends towards equality, arising from Friends' belief that all people are created equal in the eyes of God. The word testimony describes in the way that friends testify or bear witness to their beliefs in their everyday life. The testimony is therefore not just a belief, but a committed action arising out of friends' religious experience. Testimony to equality has included Quakers participating in actions that promote the equality of the sexes and racial equality, as well as other classifications of people. And I remember like really early, I had interviewed a couple students. I was just early in my research and I was reading Faith in Practice, which I happened to have gotten the New York meeting Faith in Practice, which I had brought with me when I moved to Texas and went to meeting in Texas and then I brought with me when I moved to Colorado and here I was with my old Faith in Practice 
And they had the King James Bible version of Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So that's what I had in my mind every day for six years as I worked on this book. I spent five years following the young women puzzling over the fact that here's one of our basic beliefs and here's kind of what's going on in the lives of these young women in my hometown. Um, I want to read you just a little bit from AP Calculus <laughs> class so you can kind of see Maricela in action uh, in the classroom <clears throat> and see kind of what happens just keeping the equality testimony in mind. You can sit here because Maricela isn't here today, Ulyssa told me, pointing to the desk next to hers. Maricela, I should have prefaced this by saying, um, Maricela has started to ditch class. She's starting to cut class. It's her senior year. She's not been able to figure out how to pay for college. Community college, she's charged out of state or actually international student rates. It would cost her $9,000. Her legal peers, it would cost them $3,000. She doesn't have $9,000. She can't figure out how to go to college. So she's starting to wonder if she should even bother finishing high school. Clara and Elissa are going nuts. This is driving them crazy. They want her in school. They don't want their friend to drop out. She needs to finish high school. And they are telling her so every day. And they're starting, there's a lot of friction around this. OK. You can sit here today because Maricela isn't here, Elissa said, pointing to the desk next to hers. Maricela is here, another student piped up. I just saw her. She wasn't here for first period, Elissa objected. No, Maricela is here today, the other student insisted. Two minutes after the bell rang, Maricela burst into the classroom. She pulled a desk close to us and whispered in Spanish that she'd missed first period because she'd overslept. That's no excuse, Clara replied tartly in English. Maricela said her grandparents were visiting at the moment, forcing her to sleep on the couch. Her mother had been supposed to wake her up at 5.30 a.m. so that she'd have time to take her brother to school, still get to school on time, but hadn't woken her up until 7. Still, Maricela had taken the time to look sexy. She was wearing black platform shoes, tight black trousers with pink pinstripes, a black lace top with spaghetti straps, six gold rings, and a gold necklace. She had curled her medium length hair and then secured the curls on top of her head with multiple bobby pins. Bill Paul, who taught AP Calculus, wrote an integral on the board and demonstrated a shortcut that told whether the integral converged. The shortcut was called the P-series. Does anybody remember the P-series? It all came back to me when I was sitting in this classroom <laughs> with them. I had forgotten about it for 20 years. But The teacher had barely finished writing the result on the board when Maricela interrupted him. Wait, I have a question, she called out. Can you do that P thing when you have a polynomial on the top? The teacher was amused. He had demonstrated the use of the P-series using a relatively simple equation and she was worried about whether she could use the same tool to analyze a much more complicated problem. The teacher wrote more integrals on the blackboard and asked the class to divide up into pairs. Maricela pulled her desk close to a tall, big-boned student named Miguel. OK, so which one diverges, she asked out loud. She conducted a running monologue about infinity and convergence as Miguel listened obligingly, and they finished before anybody else. Then Maricela took out a compact and began applying face powder. Clara asked about an assignment for another class, which led Elissa to pull out a book entitled Literature. Bill Paul was in the middle of explaining they were about to take practice tests to prepare for the upcoming AP exam when he noticed what Maricela and Elissa were doing. Hey, guys, girls, could you put that away until lunch? They put away the makeup and the literature book. Gracias, said the teacher. De nada, said Maricela in a saucy voice. Clara poked Maricela with a pen to keep her in line. 
¿Cómo se dice derivative in Spanish? asked their teacher. Derivado, replied Elisa. I like integration, Maricela observed. Sort of, Clara appended. On the blackboard, Bill Paul wrote, instantaneous rate of change, slope of tangent line. Then he wrote a problem that he wanted the students to solve. The class was silent. Again, Maricela got the right answer first. Eliz Maricela, when they were finished, Maricela asked Elissa about the Daniels Fund interview. Elissa pulled out a letter she had received and showed it to Maricela. I'm so happy for us, said Elissa. Me too, said Maricela gamely. This is a scholarship that all four girls had been recruited to apply for because they were so bright. Partway through the process, when Maricela and Yadira couldn't put down social security numbers, they were encouraged to drop out uh, and told they wouldn't receive any money if they stayed in the program. So they're just getting the news that their two best friends are winning the scholarship, or they're going on to the next round. They're about to win it because they're getting interviewed. And they're, they know that if they'd been able to stay in, they probably would have been doing just as well because they have those grades and that ability. Clara pulled a different letter out of her backpack. She ran her finger down the piece of paper with her brow furrowed. At Colorado College, tuition is $38,324, she announced. Guess how much I got? Like, the whole thing, Maricela ventured? That's right. Oh my god, Maricela screamed. Congratulations, I have to run out the door. I think I just swallowed my gum. <laughs> What's going on, their teacher demanded. She got a full ride to CC, Maricela cried from the doorway. That's why I was choking. The teacher turned to Clara. You got a free ride to Colorado College? All right. The bell rang. Maricela had done a seamless job of acting. She had been funny. She had been gracious. Inside, however, the familiar sensation of watching Clara and Elissa move forward with their lives as she remained stuck in place left her feeling terribly alone. Maricela had a hard time staving off a dark hopelessness. Where would she find the time to sort everything out? Senior year was rapidly unspooling. All her friends knew where they were going to college. Intellectually, she understood it was not her fault that she didn't have a social security number and couldn't figure out how to pay for a college education. But she considered herself the culprit regardless. She felt it was her fault that she could not keep up with her peers. Ashamed of her unworthiness, she had buried her emotions as deeply as she could. She didn't want her friends to know what she was experiencing because she feared they would look down on her. Maricela hid her self-doubt at school because she was tired of being at odds with her friends. So she played the party girl, talking about clubs and nightlife, anything except what would happen after June. She dropped the false cheeriness when she got home, however, where she was listless and spent hours in her bedroom. Sometimes she did her homework, but often didn't bother. She would mostly talk on the phone. One day, while cleaning her room, she came across two bags of material that she had collected from the colleges that had once wanted to recruit her. At first, she made sarcastic comments to herself as she read the pamphlets, but then she became unbearably sad. She lay down on her bed thinking about all those gorgeous college campuses. She envisioned what her life was going to be like without a college degree and saw bad things coming. Working at King Supers forever or marrying young just to get out of the house. She felt certain she would disappoint her parents. I mean, they work at maintenance jobs, she told me. I've seen how many hours a week they work and how they still struggle. My dad, ever since he got here, that's all he's done. He cleans stores in the night. I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want him to see me like that. Because I know that even though he does that kind of a job, he doesn't want me there. He doesn't want any of his children there. Um, so... We open the book, 
We see Maricel's dad wanting to come to the prom. We see that immigration can be funny, but here <coughs> is the tragedy of it because it's incredibly tragic as well um, that we have thousands, tens of thousands of young people stuck in Maricela's position all across our country through no fault of their own, uh, really struggling to figure out where they belong and why it's okay for their parents to work here and for them to work at jobs like at a supermarket or janitorial work, and yet um, they really don't seem to have an equal place in our society along with their best friends. When Maricela goes home at night, when she's at school, she's part of a foursome, two friends with legal status, herself and Yadira don't have it. When she goes home at night, she's part of a foursome, two siblings with legal status, born here, her two brothers. She and her sister don't have legal status. So everywhere she turns, when she's in her classroom, when she's in her own home, She's one of the unlucky ones, and sitting right next to her is somebody who has all of the rights and opportunities that a legal person has in our society. And it's just a heavy burden for a young person to bear. Um, I wanted to... I could go into kind of an elaborate explanation of how the families got here and how the students ended up with legal status or not with legal status, but I'm going to save that for the question and answer part. If you want that information, we can get into that. But I find when I talk to friends, capital F, there's usually a pretty high level of understanding of our immigration laws and how families wind up in this situation, but if you don't understand that, please ask me, I will explain how two girls are stuck without legal status. But I just wanted to end by moving to a different testimony, which is the integrity testimony. And um, there's, there's a lot of different ways I could talk about this, but uh, I'll tell you two stories that happened in the course of writing this book that really brought the integrity aspect of this home to me. Um, part, part one of the book is what I was reading to you. It's um, these four young women in high school trying to figure out can they all make it to college or will one of them get left behind. And in part two, we see what happens over the next four, parts two and three, next four years of their lives who makes it to college, what happens there, what the experience on the college campus is like for them. Um, but also during that time, in our own community, there was a extraordinary and terrible crime that occurred that radically changed uh, the popular understanding of immigrants and immigration. Um, a young man, uh, tried to gain entrance to a baptismal party where a family was celebrating the birth of a new child in the Mexican immigrant community. This was at a social hall called Salon Ocampo. And Maricela was invited to that party. She got in a fight with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend went to the party. She didn't go. Her cousins were there. This young man, same age as Maricela, from the same part of Mexico, never got an education never made it through grade school, was growing up in our country totally without an education, really made some bad choices in his life as well as, you know, wasn't well parented. He was uh, turned away at the door and he returned with a gun and he shot the two police officers who had turned him away, killing one of them, shot them in the back. Um, This became a huge firestorm in our home state. That young man turned out to work in the kitchen of a restaurant owned in part by my husband, who was an investor in the restaurant. And that was a moment where 
I was in a very painful way forced to acknowledge that um, I'm not just a journalist writing about those other people over there who don't lack legal status in our society. But I'm implicated. My family is implicated. There are people working in the restaurant. He had presented fake documentation. The restaurant had accepted it. You know, we were part of the story. Um, I couldn't claim objectivity or distance anymore. Um, and I think the book turns at that point. And um, uh, it deepens in a certain way to really try to understand um, what responsibility do we all have on this subject. Later I took a trip to Mexico. Yadira's mother had been arrested. Yadira had made it into college. Yadira's family had abandoned, uh, Yadira's father had abandoned her family when she was seven years old. When her mother was arrested and fled to Mexico, Yadira was left in this country without a parent. Her two teenage sisters were left here without a parent in the picture. Other family members tried to pick up where the parents left off. They did a shaky job, not always there for the kids. And Yadira tried to figure out how to get herself through college. By the end, senior year of college, a college like this one, a, a very prestigious, demanding university where she was working hard to try to do well. She had a private benefactor, a conservative Republican businessman with an immigrant background paying her tuition that she happened to meet. Um, She had one of her sisters sleeping on the floor of her dorm room because that girl had nowhere else to go. I went to visit Yadira's mother. She took me to the little town that her father was from, where their family was from originally, which had a factory which had closed down. There were no jobs. And everybody in that town had been immigrating for a long time. We walked around the town and we turned a corner and there was a homemade bus station and it had this list of places you could go. We are so far out in rural Mexico at this point. We are so far from a big city. We are in a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. And it says, Viajes Durango Express. Here are the cities you can take a bus to from this tiny little town. Remember, I live in Colorado. Colorado Springs, Colorado. Aurora, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. Longmont, Colorado. Pueblo, Colorado. And then you can also take a bus to Albuquerque, LA, Phoenix, <coughs> Chicago, and Dallas. And for me, that was just a moment of visually realizing that my home state and this little town had been having a symbiotic relationship for a really long time. Not just in Yadira's lifetime, but her mom's lifetime and her grandfather's lifetime. That for three generations, people have been coming from that town to cities all over my home state to work. That my family wasn't the only family implicated. That lots of people had been hiring these folks and that I felt my whole community bore some responsibility for the fact that Yadira had such a hard time figuring out how to pay for college, and that her friend Maricela had such a hard time in high school grappling with the fact that she wasn't equal and she didn't have status, and that, that we were all sort of in this together. And I know when we talk about immigration, there's such a habit of talking about those people over there, but I really feel to have integrity on this issue, you can't talk about it as those people over there. You, we need to start understanding 
how we are all intertwined in this issue. Um, I don't think I need to read the Wikipedia testimony and integrity. You guys know what I'm talking about. But the kinds of questions that I start to ask around this, if we're going to look at immigration and integrity at the same time, who plants the lawns that we enjoy? Who plants the flowers? Who picked the food? Who picked the fruit? Who picked the vegetables? Who's cooking in the kitchens? Who's cleaning the dorms? Um, are we going to enjoy that, the fruit of that labor and not choose to look at our own relationship to the people doing that work, or are we going to look at our own relationship to the people doing that work? And that, I think that's the question. There's so much conversation about immigration that involves blame, and there's so little conversation that ever involves taking responsibility or acknowledging responsibility or speaking in a way that says, we're part of this too, we have a piece of this. Um, I'll stop there and answer any questions that you, you, 